You know, Easter is the greatest demonstration of God's power known to man. Easter is the greatest demonstration of God's power known to man. Just think about what happened that very first Easter. The body that had been placed in a tomb just three days ago was gone. Remember, guards had been posted outside the tomb to guard it, to secure it. But then, there was an earthquake. The stone was rolled away. And understand, the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could come out. The stone was rolled away so that we could see the tomb was empty. And oh, by the way, the grave clothes that Jesus had been wrapped in, they were all nice and neatly folded up in a pile. Oh, his mother was so proud. <laughs> when the earthquake hit, soldiers were, were trembling in fear. And then, remember, there were angels posted there. They said, he's not dead, he's alive. And folks, all of this, all of this was seen by humans who walked and talked with Jesus. However, in the unseen realm, there was a whole demonstration of God's power as well. Colossians says, at the moment Jesus died, he shows up in the underworld. He shows up in the realm of the dead. He had a job to do. You see, while his body was dead, his divine living spirit went to the habitation of the demons. And he wanted to announce to them his triumph. His triumph over sin, his triumph over Satan, his triumph over death, and his triumph over hell. Colossians 2.15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Folks, understand, these cosmic forces are rulers and authorities that, that have been disarmed and put to shame by the cross. See, when Jesus died on the cross, it was a death to death. When Jesus died on the cross, it was a death to death. 1 Corinthians 15, Luke said for us earlier, it says, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Folks, understand, death means separation. Death means separation. Remember when Jesus said Lazarus is dead? What it meant that his body was separated from his spirit. And I think most of us understand physical death. We understand we're all going to die. Unless we're alive when Jesus returns, all of us, all of us will suffer from physical death. The body separated from the spirit. But there's also a spiritual death, a spiritual separation from God. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, the consequences was separation from God. They, ex they were going to experience physical death. That was going to happen eventually for them. But immediately, they experienced that separation from God. And because all of us are descendants from Adam and Eve, we're all born with that sin nature. We're all born separated from God. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. What's it mean to be born again? It means you come to a point in your life where you recognize, I have sinned against God. In my words, my thoughts, my deeds, my actions, I've sinned against God. I recognize that. And I choose to repent. Now, biblical repentance means asking God to forgive you, but it also means turning and walking a different direction. I was once living my life doing whatever I wanted to do. I go where I want to go but now I'm going to stop and I'm going to follow Jesus. That's biblical repentance. And I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord. That is a born-again experience. And those that ex have that born-again experience, they're saved from a different, the second death. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. Folks, understand, in the future, there are going to be two resurrections. The first resurrection is for all the people that are saved, all those that know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And they're resurrected, and it's going to lead to a blessing. The second resurrection is for all those who have never chosen to follow Jesus Christ. They've never declared Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And that is going to lead to judgment. 
And those who die physically and are not born again, they face eternal separation from God and a destination called the lake of fire. And if you really understood what the Bible says about this, you would not want your worst friend to go there. You wouldn't want your worst enemy to go there. You'd want them to be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 is referring to this second death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Now realize, on Good Friday, the enemy was celebrating what he had accomplished. Jesus was killed. And can you imagine the party they were having in heaven, or in hell? Remember, Satan had tried to kill Jesus 33 years ago when he was first born. Remember, the wise men had reported to Herod and they're looking for the king. And when they see the baby Jesus, what do they do? Or they leave a different way. They didn't go back and tell Herod. And so what did Herod do? He sent soldiers to murder all the male children, two years old and younger, trying to eliminate the Christ child. Three years earlier, Jesus went into the desert he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by Satan, trying to destroy him. And now, now he thinks he has him. He thinks that Jesus is dead. He's finally won. Now, I'm going to need your folks to, to work me on this. I, I, I really need you to have a great imagination on this, okay? I'm going to give you three choices. Okay, you have to choose one of these three. You could choose the Buffalo Bills, the Cleveland Browns, or the Detroit Lions. Just bear with me. Like I said, it's going to take a lot of imagination. I want you to imagine that next year, these teams turn it around and go all the way and not only go to the Super Bowl, they win the Super Bowl. See, that's why I couldn't use Pittsburgh. <laughs> they go and they win the Super Bowl. Can you imagine the parties these cities would have? I think Buffalo would celebrate for a month long. I mean, they're four-time Super Bowl losers, so they would party hardy. And, and, and whatever party you can imagine these cities having, it would pale in comparison to the party that hell is having when Jesus was crucified. Satan and all the demonic forces, they're hooping it up, they're hollering, they're, they're having a great time. And then all of a sudden, Satan feels this. Get away from me, boy. I'm having a good time here. What is it you want? And he turns around, and what does he see? A nail-scarred hand doing this. He hears, give me the keys. Give me the keys to Hades. Give me the keys to hell. Give me the keys to death, because I'm alive, and death has died. When Jesus was crucified... Death died. Three days after Jesus has been crucified, many of his followers are in despair. They're confused. Oh, they heard bits and pieces about the empty tomb, but, but they really didn't know what was going on. You talk about chaos and confusion, that's what this group was in. If you have your Bibles with you or your iPad, your iPhone, whatever it is, it is you look the word of God on, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Or you can just lead, or look on the screens with me. Luke 24. Now, as soon as I say Luke 24, I know what some of you are thinking. Pastor, this is Easter, not Christmas. <laughs> we always look at Luke <laughs> for Christmas, right? Luke 24, in verse 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, and certain women with them came to the tomb, bringing spices which they had prepared. So understand, this is the very, very first Easter Sunday morning. And we're going to skip over to verse 13 and 14. It says, Now behold, two of them, these were two disciples of Jesus Christ. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. Now we know the name of one of those travelers was Cleopas. It's mentioned in verse 18. Now, some theologians believe that this is the same person mentioned in John uh, 19, 25, just a different spelling. Uh, we're not really sure. If it was, the two people possibly would have been Jesus' uncle Cleopas and Aunt Mary. But again, it's not clearly stated. I just want you to be aware there is that teaching out there. But whoever they were, whoever they were, we know for sure they were overcome with grief 
and they were making a very, very sad trip back to Emmaus. In verses 15 and 16, it says, So it was, while they conversed in reason, that, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. You know, many of us have gone through what these two are going through. They are greatly discouraged, they are disheartened, and they are disappointed. Why? Because God didn't do what they thought he was going to do. God didn't do what they were hoping he would do. Have you ever had that happen in your life? God doesn't do what you think he should do or what you know he should do. God doesn't do what you were hoping he would do. And you feel discouraged, disheartened, and disappointed. Maybe you're in a situation where life was going great, life was good, and then all of a sudden, a split second, it changed. The doctor calls. You have four stage cancer. A police officer calls. There's a terrible car accident. Your loved one has died. All hope is gone. We can't even begin to look at the future because it can't ever be what we thought it was going to be. That's where these two are. We go on in verse, starting in 17, it says, And he, he being Jesus, said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to him, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Folks, understand, these two people were very very depressed. Have you ever been depressed? Have you ever tried to help someone who is severely depressed? Because if you have, you know how difficult it can be. Depressed people are amazingly resourceful at finding reasons not to take comfort in anything you say to them. You, they are determined to hear everything as bad news. And this is what these two did. Cleopas let it all out. His, conf his confusion, his depression, his disillusionment, his shrinking faith, his anger. And I want you to notice, Jesus did not stop him. He did not reject him. He did not rebuke him. Jesus always invites honesty with his people. And one of the things I find over and over again that puzzles me in the church is Christians will come and you know they're hurting, you know they're struggling, you know they're bitter, and yet when they pray, it's like some flowery prayer that comes out of him. Just be honest. God wants us to be honest when we come to him. He's a big God. He can take it. He just wants us to be honest with him. Well, it goes on here, starting verse 25. Then he, Jesus, said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When they drew near to the village where, the, where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And then they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, and while he opened the scripture to us? 
Didn't our hearts burn within us? You see, these two souls are left flaming in the dark at Emmaus. Jesus was gone, but they sensed his presence. They sensed his presence. Otherwise, they would have never agreed to go back to Jerusalem. Why? Because sensible people do not travel those roads at night. It's dangerous. There are too many thieves, too many robbers out there. But they realized they couldn't keep this good news to themselves. It goes on in verse 33 and says, So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So what do we have here? Here we have two disciples. It's important to understand, these are disciples of Jesus Christ. Two disciples of Jesus who were downcast, discouraged, and disheartened. They're going along through life. They're just walking along, but they are discouraged, disheartened, and downcast. And what do we see? Jesus comes, and he, he came to brighten their perspective. Jesus came to reveal truth to them. Now, it's important that we see here that D Jesus did not change their situation. He did not change the situation at all. He did not change reality. But what he did, he helped them to see it from a different perspective. I know you're sitting here thinking, well, that's great for those two, right? But that brings us to that all-important question. Come on, say it with me. So, so what? What's the application for me? How, how does this apply to my life? Folks, I'd like us to see two truths to live by. And the first truth that we need to see this Easter is the circumstances you face, the circumstances that you and I face aren't nearly as important as the conclusions you draw. The circumstances you face aren't nearly as important as the conclusions you draw. The problem wasn't what had happened. The problem was the conclusion that they had come to as a result. And Jesus comes and what's he do? He challenges their assumptions. But, but he did it, he did so after he first walked with them and listened to them. Do you see how Jesus models for us how we are to minister to someone who is grieving and hurting? He walked with them. He listened to them. He observed them before he ever spoke a word. Scripture tells us it was seven miles, the distance they had to travel. Now, we don't know how long he had been walking with them, listening to them, watching them, observing them, walking in silence. He, he, he was with them, but we don't know for how long. They had no idea who he was, but he was listening. And this is a lesson for us. Folks, we never know. We never know what's inside the people that we walk around each and every single day. People that are our coworkers. People that we bump into every day. People that we see six feet away in the grocery store. We don't know what's going on in their lives, what's going on in their hearts. People that we interact with when calling customer service. You see, the people we encounter are trying to survive life just like we are. And some of them, some of them have been given some very, very hard knocks in life. Some have been given some terrible, terrible news. And they can be discouraged. They have tragedies they have to cope with. But folks, understand there are also people that are sent around us to encourage us. Doesn't Hebrews tell us that we should show kindness to strangers because they might be angels, Hebrews 13 too. So we never know the type of people that we're interacting with. Some could be hurting that we need to minister to. Some might be there to minister to us. Well, after Jesus had walked with them and listened to them, he finally speaks to them and he challenges their assumptions. The conclusion they drew was the dream they had for a king was over. They headed to Emmaus. The party in Jerusalem was over uh, at three different times. They're talking in the past tense. They said, but we were hoping that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. He was a prophet, all past tense. They thought their best days were behind them. They thought that Jesus was their answer and now he's dead, so it's all gone. And notice, Jesus didn't instantly say that he was alive. He didn't tell them that what they had experienced wasn't reality because it was. 
They were there. They saw Jesus crucified. And how traumatic to see someone you love so taken so viciously and, and, and suffocate publicly. See, that's what would happen with crucifixion is they suffocate to death. How traumatic that would have been to watch. And yet, what he is trying to tell them is that the conclusion that you come to is incorrect. The women had reported Jesus' body was gone, and their conclusion was, someone took it. What else could it be? The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. There's no other reasonable explanation, right? Someone had to have taken the body. No other, no other choice. So they thought. And Jesus wanted them to know that what they are dealing with is difficult. What they are dealing with is very, very painful. And the truth is, there are some of you here today, some that are watching online, some here in the service, that you're dealing with some very, very difficult situations in your life. You're dealing with tremendous pain. The question is, what conclusion are you coming up to? What conclusion are you coming to? You see, these two were suffering under the weight of a story that was true. It was absolutely true, but it was incomplete. Jesus had died. That is true. Jesus is wanting them to understand. I know you're saying that I died, but here's reality. I still am who you thought I am. I still am who you thought I am. I did die, but now I'm alive. And I wonder if there's some of you that have been living in the past tense. You've been living, you've been living and telling yourself all the things that were, were. My business was. My family was. My dream was. My life was. Life will never be what it was. I can't believe this happened to me. I can't believe this is where I'm at. And if you are, Jesus is saying to you, wait, 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 wait. I've got more in front of you than there is behind you. Your best days are yet to come. We sing that one song, if I'm not dead, God's not done, greater things are, are still to come. But do we really believe it? I don't care if you're 6, 16, or 106 years old. If you've got breath in your life, God's not done in your, he's not done with you. He's got something for you to do. You're not just here wasting space. You're not here wasting air. You're here for a reason and a purpose. If you're not dead, God's not done. Greater things are still to come. Today, you may feel downcast. You may feel discouraged. You may feel disheartened. You may feel like it's all dark, but dawn is coming. You see, too many people get stuck in Good Friday. Wake up. Easter Sunday is here. Amen? Amen. Don't get stuck on Good Friday. Realize dawn is coming, and Jesus is about to do something in your life. And what does he want us to do? In Psalm 46, verse 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. You see, some of you today need to get away by yourself, get before God, and just be still before him. Because you're confused, you're disheartened, you're discouraged. And God says, I got plans for you. I got a purpose for your life. But you got to be still. You got to learn to hear my still, small voice when I speak to you. Folks, we need to come to a different conclusion about the circumstances we're in. You see, wrong thinking will always lead to wrong living. And what was true for those two disciples is true for each and every one of us today. Inaccurate facts, inaccurate facts will lead to unnecessary fear. Inaccurate facts will lead to unnecessary fear. See, once they began to see things correctly, they were open up to a whole new life, a life of hope. It's so important that we realize the power that we have in taking this information but coming up with a different conclusion. Chuck Swindoll once put it this way, and I quote, life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Listen, we can't control what happens. Remember Job? Job, God said, was a righteous man, a good man. We know Job was extremely wealthy. And then what happened? Like that one day, his wealth is all gone. 
One day, his children are completely wiped out. One day, his health is taken from him. And I think the worst of all is that one day, he lost the support of his wife. Remember, his wife said, why don't you curse your God and die? But you know, that's 10% of Job's life. Job, Job recognized that's only 10% because the other 90, 90% of Job's life, he spent time listening and talking to God. And in the end, Job drew the conclusion, God gives and God takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. God gives and God takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, in our situation, we can choose to respond in faith. We can choose to put our eyes upon Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. We can choose to worship him and praise him and come to him in prayer. Or we can choose to become bitter and angry and mumble and grumble. And nothing's ever good. It's a choice we make. When Jesus helped them to see the same situation differently, their eyes were open and they had potential. Potential that was unlocked by perspective. You see, they previously viewed walking any further as a futile endeavor. Remember, Jesus said, oh, I'm going to go a little further. He said, oh, no, no, it's dangerous. It's dark. Come on, stay with us. They viewed travel as no longer possible when they were uninformed. But in verse 31, it says their eyes were open. And once they were informed as to what was going on, they were given hope. They saw things differently. The sun had set. They had a meal together. And they left that very hour traveling the seven miles back to Jerusalem. Traveling in the dark. What had happened to these two? What changed? A spark of hope was lit off inside of them. Realize hope gives us wings. Hope motivates us. Hope energizes us. What previously would have been inconvenient and impossibility was now no roadblock whatsoever. They were ready to rush back to Jerusalem. Never mind how dark it is. Never mind how dangerous it is. They had to let others know that Jesus was alive. And that was their number one concern, sharing that truth with those they knew. You see, hope will give you the power to embrace what you previously wanted to escape. Hope will give you the power to embrace what you previously wanted to escape. These two wanted to be anywhere but Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was full of reminders. Oh, over there's the place where they crucified him. Oh, oh, over there is the place where they beat him. Oh, oh over there, that, that's where the crowd yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Over that place, that's where we had the last supper together. Oh, there's, there was a place we sat under a tree and just laughed and joked together. Oh, the place was full of memories. But he's gone. Folks, understand, we can choose to have different conclusions based on the same circumstances we face. Two people can watch their house burn down. The first one watches his house burn down and says, God's not good, my house burned down. The second person watches his house burn down and says, oh, God is good. God is good. My house burned down, but God is good because I know he's got something else in plan for me. He's got something else in store for me, and I can't wait to see what it is. Just a matter of perspective. Now, I'm not saying that we need to put on rose-colored glasses and not look at reality. Here's the key, folks. If you get nothing else out of this message, please, please get this. It's all about, it's all about looking at our circumstances through the filter of what God's plan is for me. It's all about looking through the circumstances. It's all about looking at our circumstances through the filter of what God's plan is for me. It's all about perspective. Don't suffer under the weight of a story that isn't true. Don't put a period where God has put a comma. Don't use past tense when God is a God who is not dead, who is not dead a God who is alive, a God who has something in store for you. Well, there's a second truth that we need to see this Easter and that is, there is a wrong way to read the Bible. There's a wrong way to read the Bible. They said, we thought he was going to redeem Israel, and he died. 
which is to say they ignored the fact that all the Old Testament pointed forward to a Messiah who is going to redeem Israel by dying. They just ignored those scriptures. The very thing they thought stopped Jesus from redeeming Israel was in fact the one thing that was necessary in order for Israel to be redeemed and for all of us to be redeemed. They thought, they thought that Jesus was on a political campaign. They thought that all the prophecies that are to be established were without him dying. Simply put, what these people thought or what they wanted was to see the crown, but not the cross. They wanted to see the crown, but not the cross. They wanted to see him on a throne without him ever having to wear a crown of thorns. But these things are not possible because of the price of sin. He, Jesus, had to die to pay the price for my sin and your sin. He had to go to the cross in order for him to wear the crown as king, the king of kings, a king of people from every tribe, every language, every nation in this world. This is what the Bible said Jesus would do. Now understand, they took scripture written by the prophets looking for things that would simply benefit them. Do you ever do this? Do you ever read the Bible looking for how it's going to benefit you? For example, 10 principles to make me a better spouse. Or 10 principles to help my wife, my spouse, to become a better person, right? That's really what we want, isn't it? If she would change, if he would change, then it would be, our marriage would be great. <laughs> four, four principles for managing my money. Wisdom to be a, a good parent. You see, when we look to the Bible as God saying, here's what my son Jesus did, and here's how Jesus handled the situation, and here's how Jesus felt, we realize it's not about what we can do, it's all about what he has done. We need to understand that the cross is a key component to have a right relationship with God the Father. It's, it's not about works we do to get us righteous. It's about what Jesus has done. It, it's about the work Jesus did as he hung on the cross. And when we see the scriptures that way, we see that all Jesus did and is, he has given to those who believe in him and are called upon his name throughout the day. That's what he wants for us. We get to walk in the peace and the power of the gospel because it's not up to us to keep ourselves saved. We are no longer thinking, if I behave a certain way and I do all these things, I'll get saved. We understand that we can do nothing to save ourselves. Jesus did it all. A perfect sacrifice had to be given to pay the penalty for my sin and your sins against God. So the work we do, being a better husband, being a better wife, it flows out of us because we are so grateful to the one, Jesus, who saved us. And folks, we need to really understand this simple truth. Jesus did not come to make your life better. Jesus didn't come to make your life better or my life better. Jesus came for one reason. He came to save our, your soul. Jesus came to save your soul. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, Jesus came to save us from that second death that's talked about in Revelation chapter 20. He came to save us from that eternal separation from God the Father. And when that power has worked on the inside, then we get to see it flow out of us. Jesus coming up out of the tomb has everyday implications for us. Jesus dying on the cross was paying the price for our sins, but realize Jesus raising from the dead was securing and giving us that same gift. And we who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and, and that God the Father raised him from the dead will experience that same miracle. Perhaps you've never said yes to Jesus. Or you've tried to do the church thing, but it doesn't really work out. You've tried to be kind, you've tried to be generous, you tried to be nice, but... The truth is you've never really asked Jesus to forgive your sins. You've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior. Today is a day I want to encourage you to invite Jesus into your heart. Remember, Jesus did not force himself onto these people. They invited him in. They invited Jesus in and he came in and he stayed with them. It was only after they invited Jesus in that he stepped in and remained with them. In just a moment, I'm going to lead in prayer it's going to be a prayer of invitation. If you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you. 
you can pray silently. I'll, I'll lead in prayer. You just, you can follow my prayers. And you can make that commitment to Lord Jesus Christ today. If you're able, would you please stand with me? Again, I'm going to lead in prayer. So you just pray along. You can pray silently if this is your desire this morning. Lord Jesus, today I invite you to come into my life. Please forgive me for all the times that I've wronged you, that I've wronged others. Please forgive me for the things that have hurt you. Please forgive me the times that I've hurt others. Forgive me for the times I've hurt myself. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you for paying my sin debt. Help me in the days ahead that I could grow closer to you. And I pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Worship team is going to lead us in a closing song. And if you just prayed that prayer, when the service ends, I'm going to invite you to come and see me. What I have is a little certificate I'd like to give to you. It just says, a declaration to follow Jesus Christ. This is a certify that I, and you can write your name on there, was born again. You write today's date in. I've admitted that I'm a sinner according to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 talks about how the wages of sin, what we earn, is death. It says, I've asked for forgiveness, or I asked Jesus for forgiveness, as written in 1 John 1, 9 and 10. It says that if we confess, he is faithful and just, forgive us of all our sins. He will do that. And then John 3, 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. And you just witness by someone here will be with you and go over these scriptures with you, and then you sign it. Just a reminder of when you made that commitment to Lord Jesus Christ. So again, if you prayed that prayer and you were serious, please come and see me at the end of the service.